So for those of you uh, who may be tuning in uh, now or later, uh, I'm Lynn Lancaster, the Mellon Humanities Professor at the American Academy. And today we have two of our fellows speaking, Christy Shermer and Paulette Singley. And both of our speakers today are researching food. And they have also teamed up to take us on a walk and talk to Testaccio uh, next week. So we're looking forward to that. Each one will present for about 25 minutes and then we will take all the questions after both speakers have finished. Our second speaker is Paulette Singley, who holds the Adele Chatfield Taylor Rome Prize in Historic Preservation and Conservation. And Paulette is professor in the Department of Architecture at Woodbury University in Los Angeles and is the founding director of the Woodbury University Rome Center for Architecture and Culture. Paulette originally trained as with a BR from the University of Southern California and then went on to earn a PhD at Princeton in the history, theory, and criticism of architecture, for which she wrote an Italian themed dissertation. The Metalized Marble Body, Danuncios Vittoriale in Modern Italian Architecture. And she too has worked on an archaeological dig, the American excavations at Sardis in Turkey. Paulette has just published a book called How to Read Architecture, an Introduction to Interpreting the Built Environment, which came out with Taylor and Francis in 2019. And she lent me a copy, which I've been uh, dipping into. A recent reviewer of the book notes that, quote, the author surprises the reader with the creative, humorous, and at times unexpected concepts and notions, end quote. And I think this sums up our own experience of Paulette at, here at the AAR. Uh, and as her recent open studio demonstrated, she is just full of surprises and multi-talented. Paulette has also co-edited two books called Architecture in Fashion, published by Princeton Architectural Press in 1994, and another in 2004 called Eating Architecture, published by MIT Press. And the latter perhaps explains her current AAR project called Preserving Perishables, Strategies for Conserving the Cultural History of Cuisine in Contemporary Rome. And from this larger project, she will speak to us today on intercanales or table talk, stories about Rome and gastronomy. All right, can you see that? Yes. Great, yes. thank you, Lynn, for that introduction and Christy for such a fascinating talk and amazing images. For the past few months, I have been setting the table for a conceptual dinner party on and about Rome. Leon Battista Alberti, most famously known for having written 10 books on architecture in 1452, also wrote Intercanales, dialogues intended to be read between courses set at banquets. Inspired by Alberti, the question I'm asking during my time in Rome and beyond is what might stories concerning food teach us about Rome's urban fabric architectural history and intangible cultural heritage. How does the ephemeral become infrastructural? As I shuttle back and forth between my two vocations of architectural historian and building design studio professor, I am profoundly grateful to the American Academy in Rome, Adele Chatfield Taylor, Avinom Shalem, the incredible AAR staff, and my generous and incredibly brilliant colleagues here for providing me with the support and confidence to conduct simultaneous historical research and creative work. The question remains, which is which? The table where this meal is set establishes the ground from out of which Rome will emerge and references foundation rituals that speak directly to the city's pastoral and, and agrarian beginnings, indeed to oxen and plow. In his story of Rome's origin, Livy recounts Hercules' stolen cattle, and by extension, his altars in the form Boarium, or cattle market. Of this event, Michel Serre writes in Rome, the Book of Foundations, an ox is sacrificed, the mute substitute, brute beast, dumb beast, 
Mute? No, because oxen bellow. A signal. We are no longer far from the origin. The tracks of written history flee another way. Let us try to hear the voices. The deep bellowing without meaning, rough and raw, of the oxen who bray on the altar when their blood is spilled, when their throats are cut. Let us retrace the false tracks. Following these hoof prints leads to the legend of Romulus founding Rome on the Palatine Hill by taking a white cow and bull and plowing a furrow in the ground where the defensive walls would be built, thereby creating the sulcus primogenius that established the area of the plumerium. What is a legend? Andrea Carandini advances the premise in Rome day one that the city's topography and stratigraphy now provide very important data that coincide with the main events recounted in the saga of Romulus and Remus. Livy's title of Ab Urbe Condita, written around 10 BCE, has been translated as from the founding of the city. Focusing on the term condita, in Latin, the root condo leads at once to condere, meaning to build, to found, or to make, and to condere, meaning to preserve, pickle, embalm, mummify, spice, season, or flavor. In this urban imaginary, Livy's title references the preservation of Rome and describes its incipient urban form as a table set with condiments on a culinary surface for ancient foundation rites pickled the city, so to speak, as they seasoned the ground. An imago urbis that evokes Aldo Rossi's concept shown here of designing the city as if apparecchiare la tavola, or to set the table. The first item on tonight's menu, the Piacenza liver discovered in 1877, has been interpreted as a one-to-one -one scale bronze model of a sheep's liver dating from around 100 BCE. It is understood to be an Etruscan tool of hepatoscopy, where priests known as Haruspices predicted the future and interpreted the God's will by analyzing the animal's liver. A compelling parallel exists between this artifact and a passage in De Architectura, where Vitruvius Polio recommends how to identify a proper site for founding a city. He writes, when about to build a town, our ancestors sacrificed some of the cattle that fed on the proposed site and examined their livers. If the livers were dark colored or abnormal, they sacrificed others. If they continue to find it abnormal, they argued that the food and water supply found in this place would be unhealthy. To prepare Roman style veal liver, the organ must be fresh, bright in color and compact in consistency. Like all offal, it is in fact highly perishable. After slicing the veal liver, make three to four small cuts on the edges so that it does not curl during cooking. cooking. If it has large blood vessels, remove them with a small knife. Finally, do not cook it for long as it becomes hard. Panis perforius, panis rigidus, panis militaris, panis nauticus, buculatum, panis oligenius, panis cabarus, panis secundarius, pelbius rusticus, panis quadratus, panis particus, pane nero, pane unico, pane, pane, pane. We know a substantial amount of information regarding the history of bread in Italy, with recipes dating back to ancient Rome and physical evidence left to us from ovens in Ostia Antica and carbonized loaves of panis quadratus found in Pompeii and shown here. The history of fermentations or grain distribution tells a monumental story of trade from Sicily, Spain, North Africa, and Egypt, bringing wheat to a hungry city. When considering the importance of bread and the anona, the grain dole, to the urban development of ancient Rome, the magnitude of this enterprise, from the construction of ships and ports to mills, storage facilities, and distribution centers, demonstrates the significance of alimentary urbanism and city building from a particularly culinary perspective. We know less about actual bakeries with few archeological traces remaining in the city of Rome. In what follows is a litany of some of the more important sites and moments of the history of bread in the city. The Temple of Ceres on the Aventine dedicated in 493 BCE was an early site for the distribution of grain as was later on the Porticus Manuchia, Frumentaria probably carried out at the time of Claudius during the first half of the first century CE located in the area of Bovardo, Argentina. Along with two altars to Hercules in the area of the Forum Boarium is the Statue of Nona, a site for the distribution of grain into which has been inserted Santa Maria in Cosmodon, a sixth century church associated with the Diaconia, an institution for the distribution of charity. 
Robert Code Stevens uncovered traces of a substantial milling complex complete with Dolian mills and flower bases in the area of the Porta Maggiore. Here also remains the most significant artifact of ancient baking in Rome, the tomb of the freedman and baker Marcus Virgilius Eurasis and his wife Atistia, dating from around the end of the Republic. The following five activities are engraved and originally painted on the monument. The purchase of grain and its delivering to the baker contractor by the public officials, the milling through two millstones pulled by blindfolded donkeys, the transformation of grain into flour, the rolling of loaves, and finally the delivering of baked loaves into shops. Responding to his changing the gold dole from grain to loaves of bread, of particular importance is Septimius Severus's introduction of an industrial scale set of water powered mills on the Janiculum Hill fed by the Aqua Triana just underneath the American Academy. But there is more to this story. In 537, the Byzantine general Flavius Belisarius defended Rome against the Gothic siege, during which time the invaders blocked the aqueducts and therefore closed the mills. Belisarius acted quickly and established mill boats in the Tiber, which lasted until the 1870 flood of Rome and the building of the embankment. Fast forward to the fascist era, Mussolini launched his battle for grain in 1925 as an agricultural production plan that was the foundation of the regime's plan for self-sufficiency, while he also colonized the Pontine marshes south of Rome and portions of Libya and Ethiopia in response to an agricultural initiative to grow wheat and produce healthy fascists. The iconography of Mussolini's battle for grain remains in place in the area of the Mausoleum of Augustus and the colonial town of Sabaudia, just south of Rome. For our antipasto, we begin with the quintessential Roman food, the Romana or Mamala artichoke, prepared Jewish style. Carciofi alla Judea are deeply fried so that the outside leaves are crispy and melt in your mouth as the inside heart remains tender and moist. While debate exists as to whether it was the cardoon or the artichoke that ancient Romans ate, Arabs brought vegetables like eggplant, artichokes, and spinach to Sicily around 827, after which Jews introduced them to the north of Italy. After they were expelled from Spain in 1492, Jews found welcome reception in Rome, so that by 1555, when the ghetto was established, the incoming refugees introduced a uniquely Sephardic approach to cooking, as well as refined nuances from Catalan cuisine. Think of raisins and pine nuts. This would include the method of deep frying food in olive oil, a technique that also comes from the Levant, seen in the preparation of fried squash blossom stuffed with mozzarella and anchovies and fried bacala. A key to Jewish cuisine are kashrut rules, wherein all meats must be slaughtered and drained of blood, after which the organs are meticulously examined for anomalies. If anything suspicious is discovered, the carcass is discarded. This attention to detail, according to Karima Moyer Noki, gave Jewish butchers a reputation for quality that brought in business from the general public throughout Rome. Likewise was the impact of having been locked in a small space with little access to diverse ingredients. When we think of cucina alla romana, cooking with few ingredients, eating awful and making do with very little, many of these recipes actually descend from cucina alla Judea. Filippo Tommaso Maronetti and Luigi Colombo published their Manifesto della Cucina Futurista in 1930 writing, we believe first of all it is necessary to abolish pasta, an absurd Italian gastronomic religion. As Daniele and Caligari argues, Maronetti protested against the surprising power invested in Pellegrino Artusi's cookbook, Science in the Kitchen and the Art of Eating Well from 1891, while forging the foundation for futurist fascist marriage based on the rejection of pasta. Thus we begin our primo, our first course of strozza preti with tomatoes, literally translated as choke the priest. This pasta references anti-clericalism at a time when the loss of the papal states figures highly in Rome's urban morphology and memory. As Zaretta Zanini de Vita explains, political anti-clericalism, which arose with the Roman Republic, was transferred to the table. And in the trattorias, the rage was for a type of pasta that is still known today as strozza preti. Similarly, similarly Karima Moyernochi and Giancarlo Rolandi contend, osterias were seen as dens of sedition. 
New Osturias opened around this time, often frequented and run by manja friends, priest eaters. An itinerary of priests choking Rome would include the Piazza della Repubblica and its fountain of the naiads, which features four naked female bodies. In 1901, they replaced the less lascivious plaster lions initially placed here in 1888 when Pope Pius IX had the fountain built to commemorate the creation of a new aqueduct. It also would feature the Ministry of Transport and headquarters of the Italian railways, the Ministry of Public Instruction, the Palace of Expositions, the Palace of Justice, and the monument to Victor Emmanuel II. White is a rare and startling color for Rome, a city of amber hues, one that glares at spectators in the strong Mediterranean light, to the extent that these behemoths develop size and chromaticity to dominate the city. But thus far, I have been considering pasta allegorically rather than instrumentally as part of an alimentary system that influenced the shape of the city. From this perspective, we might consider the 19th century development of processed dry pasta. Wrapping around Santa Maria and Cosmodin, the church mentioned earlier for having been constructed within an ancient Roman statue of Nona, it's a building formerly housing the Pastificio Pantanella dating from 18, 1878, Rome's first factory. It is sited in what would have been a larger industrial district with gas works at that time located in the Circa Massimo. This and other pastifici in Rome announced the industrialization and modernization of the capital city with a food product that will begin to construct a national Italian identity, along with Artusi's cookbook, for a country which as of yet had none. Even during a light rain, the scent of bovine urine seeps up from the ground of Rome's Campo Boario and Ex Matatoio, the former livestock market and slaughterhouse. The odor recalls the hundreds of thousands, how many? of living creatures who spent their last hours pent up here. Though saturated, this soil is sacred, marked by the spilled blood and excrement of innumerable cows, pigs, sheep, and goats who were converted here from sentient, be sentient beings into comestibles. If we listen closely, we can still hear the lowing of the cows as they move past the gates. From the foam boarium to the Campo Boario, oxen walking through Rome's foundational mythology and into the Rione of Testaccio. Between ancient Roman cuisine and contemporary designer food, Testaccio holds several important culinary topographies, including the Monte dei Cocci, literally meaning Mount of Shards, traces of ancient warehouses for storing food supplies, remnants of the ancient river dock called the Emporium, the Campo Boario, the Ex Matatoio, the New Testaccio Market, and an enticing post for this landscape, evoking the imagery of one of Giorgio de Chirico's landscape paintings. It also houses historically significant restaurants that serve recipes taken from the cow's fifth quarter, the Quinto Corto, such as Tripa alla Romana, our secondo, or Rigatoni con la Pagliata, a traditional Roman dish using the intestine of a young calf filled with mother's milk. Testaccio's topographic focal point is the Monte dei Cocci, also known as the Monte Testaccio, dating from approximately CE 140 to 250. This is an artificial hill that the ancient Romans systematically constructed from broken pottery shards. It's called teste, of amphora containing olive oil coming from Spain and North Africa. As Rome contracted from this area after 500 CE, it eventually was discovered that the broken terracotta parts, pots forming the hill provided porous ventilation that formed a natural cooling system for wine cellars dug deeply into the hillside. With the wine cellars eventually came small restaurants and a vibrant community of enoteque that surrounded the hill. Almost, almost immediately after unification, when Rome became the capital of the Kingdom of Italy in 1871, in October 1873, Alessandro Viviani's Piano Regolatore, or Master Plan, included social housing for the workers of the proposed slaughterhouses. Built between 1888 and 91, according to designs by Joaquino Ersac, the new Matatoya represented at its time the most modern and rationalized slaughtering processes in Europe. Workers here were partially paid with Quinto Quarto animal parts, 
The awful remains they would not sell on the common market that they learned to transform into the aforementioned meals. At last we turn to our dolce, sauce of musket pears from Bartolomeo Stefani's, Stefani's The Art of Cooking Well of 1662. The arrival of sugar to Western Europe eventually resulted in serving desserts as a discreet last sweet course. Prior to the Baroque era, sugar was used as medicine or applied almost indiscriminately to meat, fish, poultry dishes in a matter, manner similar to how we use salt today. Pope Clement IX, Giulio Ros Giuliosi, served Queen Christina of Sweden, Paris, for a banquet held at the Quirinale in December of 1668 and decorated the table with trionfi, sculptures of buildings, animals, and capricci made entirely out of sugar. This commodity remained a luxury item to the extent that serving it as inedible pieces of sculpture ornamenting a table was an act of supreme extravagance. With this final course, Rome transforms from the eternal to the ephemeral city in an urban mise-en-scene composed of molded sugar, mottled marzipan, and semi-transparent gelatin. Queen Christina journeyed from Sweden after having abdicated her crown to Rome, where she formally entered the city on 23 December 1655 in order to convert from Protestantism to Catholicism under the supervision of Pope Alexander VII. Fabio Chigi. Forming a paradigmatic urban Gesundkunstwerk to conclude her journey and the political ecclesiastical triumph she represented, Alexander VII organized a papal parade, organized a parade across the papal city where numerous events, fireworks displays, and banquets were held to celebrate her arrival. He commissioned Jean Lorenzo Bernini to transform the interior southern facing facade of the Porta del Popolo which stood as something of an unfinished ruin by adding his family's coat of arms, a curvilinear pediment, and the inscription, the happy and prosperous entry in the year of 1655. Alexander VII charged Bernini with organizing the banquet of 26 December, San Stefano's Day, held in her honor. Working with Giovanni Paolo Shore, Bernini designed a series of triumphi illustrating iconographic themes. When Cristina moved her accommodations from the Vatican to the Palazzo Farnese, Carlo Reynaldi designed a temporary facade to honor the queen's new temporary home. Her triumph across Rome and the accompanying theatrical events held throughout the city gave occasion for Alexander VII, again working with Bernini, to inaugurate, or at least legitimize, the larger transformation of Piazza del Popolo. He saw to the renovation of Santa Maria del Popolo and the construction of the pair of churches, Santa Maria in Monte Santo and Santa Maria dei Miracoli, at the end of the Corso, the former Via Lata. The buildings these churches replaced at the Trivium consisted of a disorganized cluster of a chapel and some houses. Following the food ways of Bernini Triomphi and the recipe for poached pear takes the history of sugar to European colonial expansion. Christopher Columbus carried sugarcane seedlings from the Canary Islands to the New World on his second voyage to Hispaniola in 1493. The introduction, introduction of sugar slavery in the New World changed everything, as Khalil Gibran Muhammad explained, so that over the four centuries that followed Columbus's arrival on the mainlands of Central and South America and Mexico, Guiana, and Brazil, as well as on the sugar islands of the West Indies, Countless indigenous lives were destroyed and nearly 11 million Africans were enslaved, just counting those who survived the Middle Passage. And while it is on this bitter note that we begin to conclude our illusory banquet, let us recall that the table and its traditions operate as urban traces as well as physiognomic instruments. To amplify the significance that the ephemera and detritus of daily life pressure on the construction of a body politic, I will conclude with a brief quotation from Michel de Certeau and Luce Gerard from The Practice of Everyday Life. The wordless histories of walking, dress, housing, or cooking shape neighborhoods on behalf of absences. They trace out memories that no longer have a place, childhoods, genealogical traditions, timeless events. Such is the work of urban narratives as well. They insinuate different spaces into cafes, offices, and buildings. 
To the visible city, they add those invisible cities about which Calvino wrote. With the vocabulary of objects and well-known words, they create another dimension, in turn, fantastical and delinquent, fearful and legitimating. For this reason, they render the city believable. They are the keys to the city. They give access to what it is, mythical. These narratives also constitute powerful instruments whose political use can organize a totalitarian system. Thank you. See you next Monday for our very last chat talk. Thank you.